Hello everyone. So myself Lakshya Dattwani, and I'll be today leading mainly on Azure SQL, uh, which is a service that Azure offers. And I have been working as a database administrator uh, from around five years now. So I will just quickly uh, intro like what responsibilities we have since there are many people who are non-IT background. So mainly our job is to clear up the mess which our team creates like data engineers create or in future you might be creating up. So we just try to maintain each and everything uh, like servers are up and running fine. All services are available. Connections are working well. There are no space crunches that we'll be running in. Uh, it's not like clearing the maze. Mainly we are facilitating database engineers uh, in their work and uh, future wise we can also move to data engineers and data engineers are also working on database administrator tasks so there is no such diversion uh, in future like no much diversion in future so i'll quickly begin yeah so before beginning, uh, there are various RDBMS st structures we are all might be dealing on, uh, be it uh, MySQL, Aurora, MySQL in Amazon, be it Azure SQL, be it MariaDB, be it Oracle, and number of RDBMS which we are dealing on. And we really don't know like how they are functioning, how they are working. We just query and get results and we just do our stuff. So. I have just I have just added one slide of SQL Server architecture, which will show us like how the SQL Server is functioning. So if if we get to know this part, it would be very much clear for us uh, in all database technologies, like behind the scene, what is happening. Uh, it is not same in all technologies. Like Oracle will have its different set of tools and things. Uh, MySQL will have different and. IBM has its own database, which, which will have different configurations and different tools, but behind like overall the architecture is similar, like things are same, like backup is same, but the way to perform is different in Oracle, in SQL, in uh, MariaDB and something else. So if, if you get to know any one RDBMS architecture, it would be easy to us to understand all other architectures. So I'll quickly explain like how SQL Server works and how we are getting the data and what's happening behind the scenes. So consider a library. Uh, if we have all the books which are unmanaged and which are just dumped in one box or in bulk storage, it would be difficult for us to segregate like which book to pick up. Suppose I want to read uh, any book which is related to science. I want to read some book which is related to general knowledge. I want to read some book which is related to sports. So for me, it's very difficult to figure out in the bulk. So in a library, there are different sections like uh, general knowledge books are placed at this part, uh, scientific books are placed at this part and sports book are placed at this part. We go to that column, we just uh, try to figure out which book we want and we just go to that section and we take our, our book from the set of books which we want. So similarly, SQL, uh, like RDBMS is a relational database engine where there is a segregation of data based on rows and columns and we can pick uh, like in application it's data is divided in few categories like suppose in application there are user details so you user details are placed in one table and uh, client details are placed in another table product details are placed in another table so different segregation is made and we can just go to our section and get the info which we need so that's the main concept behind our dbms coming in the picture so Going to SQL Server architecture, it's a server client based architecture. Uh, basically client server architecture works in a way where client asks server some request which server accepts and process and responds. So that is behind the scene happening. So here I have SQL Server uh, network interface and it, it, it asks the protocol layer some information. Now protocol layer, protocol as a name suggests it's like a set of rules which are available. So any information which is processed inside the server, inside the database has to follow some rules. So basically this type of protocols are there in all RDBMS architectures. So protocols are like shared memory, TCP IP and named pipes. So I will make it very clear like how this works behind the scene. Okay, so first beginning with the shared memory, uh, I'll explain in layman term what is shared memory. 
so consider like we have participants many sometimes we have amit in the participant consider like amit is there at his home and uh, he wants to drink a coffee and he tells his mom like uh, mama i need a coffee so his he is at home and his parents are at home he is asking for a coffee at home his mother prepares the coffee and delivers to him here amit will act as client and his mom will act as a sql server and the home where he is asking to do that is the shared memory so shared memory is like one single machine where client and server both are installed at the same place and it can it can easily deliver out the results like without any connection details or without any ports or any information provided since they are in part, they are in the same home or they are in the same machine so there is no need of uh, area communication in that so shared memory works in this way uh, second we have tcp ip connection now consider <laughs> vinod uh, he he loves coffee a lot so in afternoon suppose he is feeling to have some coffee he just calls out to starbucks and he gets his coffee delivered at his home so right now we know there is a client and starbucks is a sql server which is quite busy in serving other clients as well so he calls them up and he tells them to deliver the coffee at his home but he needs to provide his address to them to get the coffee delivered so in tcp ip we need to provide the server name uh, like a client address where the request has to be processed and also we need to give the port number for sql server default port is 1433 but uh, we need to uh, like for tcp ip connection we need to give instance name and port number and coffee gets delivered to his place through this way so consider a client in a remote location and a server at a different location during that time we can make connection through tcp ip protocol there is no way to make an, a connection in different way so shared memory i gave, gave you an example how it works in a home tcp ip how it works in a remote location coming to named pipes named pipe is something like it's it's kind of intranet thing where pe like people are connected through lan like uh, considering um, uh, vinod and vicky lives uh, like near to each other so basically uh, he, if 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 vinod wants something from vicky they are in the neighborhood so they are connected through internet and he'll ask him to give uh, to bring some books which he needs and vicky at the evening will bring and bring the books to his home so that that kind of structure comes in the name pipe and these are the three protocols through which server and client communicate with each other in sql server shared memory tcp ip and named pipes so shared memory is something like which is in the internal in one machine client and server both are installed at the same thing tcp ip is like a remote connection where uh, we need to provide connect like instance name and the port through which it will try to communicate and named pipe is something like intranet where they are there is a lan connection between the uh, server and client now like the communication through these channels happens with with the tds tds nothing but tabular data stream so basically they are the network packets in which data is transmitted and received through tds is they are it's kind of a channel which through which data is received and processed so sql server consists of basically uh, three things protocol layer relational engine and storage engine so protocol layer is i hope it is clear to everyone now now coming to relational engine after passing after the request passing to protocol layer it comes to a relational engine now relational engine consists of three parts that is command parser optimizer and query executor now these three components have their own specific features and like usage so what does command parser do like if i am putting any query select star from a table name so command parser will check it like it's syntactically and semantically correct or not so syntactically correct means like the grammar should not be wrong so command parser has it's like it 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 has the structured query language sql language inside it and it tries to uh, match whatever we type in the query and it it should match the things or else it will throw out an error so suppose if instead of select i am typing s c l e c r instead of t 
so command parser will quickly error out like you are giving a wrong argument select car should be select so it has in it it has inbuilt language which it has and like it it compares with whatever we query and it's based on that it will result out the output so after like uh, it's it checks syntactical and semantical error syntactical i explained like a grammatical error and semantical error is something like Mm, it it tries to check like whatever we are querying is actually there in the database. It's something we are not querying which is not in the database. Like suppose if I query a table that is not present in the database, it will throw out an error that object doesn't object is not present. So it it tries to maintain the integrity of the database. It's it tries to give whatever is needed, whatever is required, and like one should not uh, like end up use uh, like querying anything. So it it keeps the check on that part. After after the query is passed syntactically and semantically, it it forms a query tree kind of execution plan, like how it needs to get executed. Executed, then optimizer comes in a picture. Now I'll not go in very deep deep. I'll just explain uh, in one or two liner what it's what what is its function. So basically, what optimizer does is it it gives a query plan which is the cheapest to SQL Server, like which is the it tries to give a plan which is fastest to the SQL Server. There can be multiple other plans which may think, which we may think like uh, is faster or so slower. But optimizer tries to give like uh, according to his algorithms, according to its own algorithms, it tries to give whatever is the cheapest plan. Now, uh, in a way, I'll ex try to explain. Like, suppose we all want to open a bank account, uh, and there are multiple banks involved. Uh, there are multiple banks which are available right now like icici hdfc access etc etc and i know that one bank can open my account in two days and also i know there is some bank which can open my account in one day but to figure out which is that bank i may spend one or two days so it's better to open account in a bank which which i'm sure shot will open in two days rather than figuring out like which will open in uh, one day and then uh, try to open account in that which will be in one day like it may take three to four days in that process so sql server tries to give the cheapest plan uh, like it will there will be more more fastest plan available inside the sql server but to figure out that plan it will take more time so it will try to give the plan which is whichever is readily fixed fixed available to sql server like in a two days this will have account will get open so it will go for that plan so in the sense it will create a plan which it feels should will give the cheapest fastest result there may be other way to execute a query but it will try to execute based on its own algorithm and that is kept with microsoft and they are not shared to anyone till now so optimizer that decides like how the query will be executed query executor as the name suggests will execute the query and uh, these are the main main part of the relational engine of the sql server then comes storage engine so basically as the name suggests uh, storage is like the main main key part of the sql server where the data is stored now there are multiple components to the storage engine like file types access method buffer manager plan cache so we'll begin with the file types so data which is stored inside the storage engine is in form of pages what we see when we query select star from something is tabular like a column and row but behind the scene data is in form of pages now what is page according to you you can consider page as a as a normal book page but in sql server it's very big uh, it's not a small page but you can consider a small book page where there are multiple tables put in together and the file types in sql server is like mainly mdf and ndf and ldf like they, those are the extensions which we have basically in storage engine we have file types which are mdf ndf and ldf mdf and ndf are the core data things like which like in which total whatever data is there which is stored in the database and ldf is something called log file so whatever we do whatever transactions we do like update inserts deletes etc etc so those gets recorded in the log file and they are used for our point in time recovery process like if to just keep keep the track of the transaction which are going in the databases we have this log file called ndf so it it keeps the 
track of the transactions happening in the databases and uh, like these are not the actual data these are just uh, kind of records which are changing like transactions which are happening so second thing comes is the access method uh, so our query executor which i explained earlier in relational engine gets connected to access methods so what does access method do is like it 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 tries to figure out the query is either select or non select if it is a select one it it tries to push that query in the buffer manager and what this buffer manager is like um, sql server has its own buffer manager uh, like suppose if i execute some query and uh, like we say in our mobile species there is something called cache here. in the same way this buffer thing works so in buffer sql server tries to store the output if the query is small and the plan as well like how the query executed so next time if we query it doesn't really hit the database or data files like mdf and ldf it it tries to give the result from the buffer manager so that we get the faster results and our disks are not hit and because disks are costly and there is high io involved in the disk so this is kind of a memory thing like from memory we are getting the output so if at all a query is select it will definitely hit the buffer manager if it finds the like if it executed similar kind of query earlier there would be some cache or data which is stored in the buffer manager it will try to give the result back to access methods from access method again query will get pushed to query executor uh, which will execute the query and it will result result out the query results will be provided to protocol layer which will be dis like further displayed to us so if a query is select access method works in this way now if query is non select like update insert delete or any ddl thing uh, create drop anything so it it goes to transaction manager and transaction manager ha has two parts uh, like there is lock and log so log as i uh, explained you ldf file thing so it's like a ldf file it it records the transaction changes in the log and lock is something like there is something called atomicity uh, which you can you guys can google out uh, in your free times so lock is something like it it tries to acquire some lock in the tables and whenever we try to query it it will not result like suppose there is one table which i am trying to update right now and someone is trying to select that table so if i am updating other guy is selecting some record so what what he should see he should see the new updated value at the run time or he should see the older record so that calculations are performed by the lock manager it it it's based on the isolation level that we set like if you want to make the client see the earlier version before the update we can set it that way there are some terminologies and some more concepts behind it if the time if time permits we'll definitely go to those concepts so basically it tries to put lock on the resources that are like table objects like tables stored procedures views and all other objects and log is something where we can see the log logging like update insert any data change we try to keep the log of that and uh, coming back uh, here to plan cache uh, so as i told like sql server tries to have the execution plan stored in the buffer so it 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 is called as plan cache so the way the query executed priorly it tries to give the same same way during the next run as well and some data is also stored which is called data cache and uh, there are some there is something called dirty pages uh, it's it's like the redundant data uh, which is very older and which which will flush out uh, when the memory will be filled up so it it has some concept behind the dirty pages but overall architecture i think we are clear now how it works so any rdbms the way it works is in this way like behind the scenes there are these components which result out the query when we query any server any database behind the scenes these are the processes that are happening when we see any result so i just wanted to give the overview of sql server and based on that we can figure out like what's happening behind the scene so i'll quickly recap like a uh, sql network interface we try to query some query it goes through protocol layer protocol layer has three parts shared memory tcp ip and named pipes uh, i explained three three of them 
and how the data is processed through tabular data stream it, it's like a network packet it's, it's like a channel to process out the data from client to server and relational engine is like a query checking part like which how the query should be executed and is the query correct or not that part uh, relational engine takes place takes care of and then it's like storage engine uh, in storage engine like file how the data is stored we are seeing how data is stored access method like what is the query type select or non-select based on that it takes the action and buffer manager is like a memory uh, kind of a cache thing where the query is stored plan cache is also the cache how the query was executed priorly like a plan of a query and it tries to execute in the same way basically because of this buffer manager and cache our query will result faster compared to hitting the disk and returning the result and data parsing yeah so like it's the same thing and transaction manager basically there are two processes in it a log and lock log is something like keeping the change track of the change in the databases lock is something like which objects to allow to allow us to query okay so we'll move to the next slide now yeah so let's just to uh, uh, add on top of your information uh, to the participants i know this is a two more of a technical information here, uh, what Laksh explained right now. Uh, but don't worry, I know this is uh, <laughs> a lot of technical information which you presented so far. But uh, what I wanted to say here is do not worry, you will not get any questions from these concepts. But, right, so we have so many database developers out there in the market. But trust me, more than 60% of them doesn't have any knowledge on these kind of architectures because we don't really care about this, right? Even, even me, I do not have any knowledge on this. Because, you know, Laksh is a part of administrator group and he has all these kind of internal uh, schemas and all these internal architectures and pipelines. But guys, when, when you're really trying to optimize your query, when you wanted to optimize the performance, this, this, these concepts and these modules are really important because you wanted to try, you wanted to optimize your query, you wanted to improve the performance of your query. So you really need to know your internal database architecture so that, you know, like you mentioned, you have cache, you have disk, if you wanted to retrieve something from disk, you have IO operations, right? But when it comes to cloud, right, you don't really have to worry about that because you have horizontal scaling, you have vertical scaling, that's what you're going to show in the coming slides. But do not worry about all this technical information, you will not get any questions here, but having this knowledge is really important and it will really help you in terms of interviews, right? Because if someone asks that, have you worked in optimization techniques? Have you ever performed any uh, perform any improvements in the query performance? So that at least you keep this picture in your mind so that at least you can say something, right? Just use these terminologies so the interviewer might know that, oh, he kind of worked in that. We might not know complete details, but he kind of worked in that. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Lex, please go ahead. Yeah, and behind the scenes, even on cloud also, they are performing these activities, but it's very hidden to us. But the architecture is kind of the same behind the scenes, which Microsoft or Azure takes place. But yeah, they manage by themselves. We really no need to go into it. So any RDBMS tries to have this kind of architecture, but uh, here and there, some minor changes would be there, but overall architecture would be like this. Okay, now moving like we ha uh, we had this physical server sql server now why we need to move to azure like why azure is in picture why we are moving to azure so i'll quickly go uh, like in speeding up things so first thing is azure is fully managed so what 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 is mean by fully managed is like we really don't need to control any administrator stuff like it's very minor uh, if in a physical server, we are having four to five database administrator in Azure, one is enough. So it really, really reduces the human workload. First thing, it's a threat to me and other database administrators because we might end up losing our jobs. But at the same time, it, it gives us an opportunity to upgrade ourselves and move to cloud and few other technologies. So we don't have any option, but we need to upskill ourselves. Upskill ourselves. And second thing it gives us is fully managed i i wanted to say like most of the things which a normal database administrator used to do on physical sql server is taken care in azure by itself uh, consider it backup consider it optimization consider it indexing consider it tuning techniques tuning techniques when i say it's like how to make the query faster 
so those suggestions and all azure provides and takes care but still we need one guy to to see like everything is open uh, happening properly and manage it so yeah second part is predictable performance and pricing so in azure um, we can predict like how much price range can go up to like we can set a budget it should not exceed by this if it exceeds i need to know by alarm and also we can see the performance on live like how cpu is running and what are the things happening like how memory is taking place like how much memory is consumed how much cpu is consumed how much io operations are happening those all in physical physical server we needed to integrate third party tools like solar winds and few other things in azure it takes care of it, it like takes care itself like it has inbuilt monitoring tools second third third thing in azure which is good is elastic pool for unpredictable workloads so what does this mean is we can have group of databases in azure and they will take a set of resources and they will internally manage the resource consumption what i am trying to say here is like consider i have i have a database which takes cpu 90% from 12 to 2 am and after that it takes 10% there is other database which i have which takes cpu 90% at 5 to 7 am and like during 12 to 2 it takes 30% so overall i can club both the databases together and i can give them like certain amount of cpu and they both will manage by themselves like at 12 to 2 time my first database will take the cpu same cpu would be used by second database at the evening time so this is guy this is guys like really cool feature where we can save a lot of money and we can use the resources again and again and in physical we can't do that like we need to assign a hard coded like fixed kind of cpu memory to a server so azure is offering this great feature called elastic pool for unpredictable workloads like suddenly if my workload is increasing it will keep some buffer cpu memory and other resources which are needed and it will allocate on the fly whenever needed again work is done it will take back the resources third thing is 99.99% availability which is very difficult to obtain in a physical or virtual vms so it's like there is azure make sure like we don't get a downtime but still 0.001% chances are there to have downtime and as it's a machine we can't be like 100% reliable but like this is a great 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 benefit third thing is uh, okay fifth thing is like geo replication and restore services so in virtual vms and physical servers we have methodologies to have high availability and disaster recovery and have the replicas of the server we need to really work like 3 to 4 days to set up a dr or high availability features we really really need to work a lot to set it up in the multiple regions but on the fly in azure we can have a replication created where data is moving from one database to other database and like like it it reduces lot of efforts costs and like much more things the other cool feature is like it it supports the existing sql server tool uh, the which tool i was showing you earlier was ssms which is a monit like a gui tool for the sql server and that gui is supported by azure so it we really don't need to change many things while moving to cloud it tries to give us as much leeway it, like it it can give so other cool feature is scalability with no downtime so we can scale our database servers databases without downtime which is really really cool and i remember i worked on physical environments and virtual vms coordinating with multiple teams is really really a hectic thing we need to shut down our database services we need to apply patches we need to bring it up back we need to like coordinate with app team we need to coordinate with qa people we need to coordinate with development team and like many many more things like communication to the client we need to send out like our application would be down we might be using many bank applications like icici and all which says like there will be a maintenance window from this to this time and you will not be able to uh, use the services so still sometimes maintenance may be needed in cloud but it's pretty less and you might be seeing these activities very less nowadays whichever applications are there on cloud and the most important thing is the security uh, 
security part azure has taken care a lot 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 of like efforts to make it highly secured like azure sql is very 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 much secure i will talk about it like how secured it is in uh, next slides but yeah these are the main main features that azure sql offers and why we can think to move on azure okay so getting to the point right now so mainly when we have database offerings on azure there are two types uh, which we know discussed yesterday infrastructure as service and platform as service so the main difference between these two i'll try to explain in layman terms is consider um, consider a normal restaurant you want uh, to go in like in any area and if you go to a restaurant you have list of menu or list of food items which you want to buy and like you will have a variety of things and you can put on the like you can order multiple things but at the same time if you want to eat a pizza mostly you will choose dominos or pizza hut or something like of that nature so we can exactly relate those things here like infra infrastructure as a service is something like you will have your own vm inside that you can have your own applications whatever you want you can have microsoft sql server installed in it also you can have your schedulers you can have your application installs and whatever software you want it's your vm so it's kind of a restaurant where you can have multiple things but if you are pretty sure you want a database thing to run on the system and you want only only database like you can go for a dominos for a pizza same kind of plat platform as a service thing is the same kind of thing if you are pretty sure your your only requirement is a database you can go for platform as a service with without a second thought if you are building a new application and if you are having an existing application and it is having a lo lot of data and lot of softwares installed and it has to do multiple things which it is doing then people do choose azure vm to go for and it it is advantageous as well like like nothing is right and wrong so based on the requirement case to case basis we select like what things we can go for so infrastructure as a service azure sql offers us to create a vm uh, like that would be managed by azure like vm would be managed by azure infrastructure is would be managed by azure but inside things would be our own like sql server we need to manage our own now there was a case in my experience came like uh, generally what organizations do is they buy the licenses in pool for sql server or any other rdbms so they buy it for 3 to 4 years and uh, right now if they move to cloud that money is getting wasted three years money which they have already paid till now so what they do is they take this azure vm and they put the same license here in azure vm so that their cost is not uh, wasted and also they are getting few features of cloud as well like other services of cloud so in that case we can choose azure vm however sql uh, that azure also offers like if we submit our licenses back it offers some discount but that money may not be worth like it offers 30% 50% discounts but them that that might not be worth so mainly it it has to be very calculative decisions while making the decisions because it's at the end uh, vitamin m that's money involved so we need to be very careful in deciding what we want what we really want so coming on platform as a service there are three offerings that azure offers first thing is single database second thing is elastic pool which i tried to cover in the earlier slide third thing is azure managed instance so we have four options if we are going in azure sql area like a single database elastic pool managed instance and azure vm so if we have a application which requires multiple software multiple antiviruses and no interference of microsoft or any other thing we can definitely go for azure vm and install a sql server in it it would be like normal your system and you are installing a sql server on it um, a traditional way but if you want like a feature where it's like you have your you are pretty sure you want only database uh, functionality you can go for single database elastic pool and managed instance so single database is something like a a single database which azure will create and it will have its resources tagged to it like cpu would be this database individual cpu 
um, memory would be this database's individual memory. Consider it any resource that a database needs, which would, it would be tagged to this particular database. Elastic pool is particular, which I explained earlier. So I'm not repeating it. A managed instance is something like a VM, which, which, which has set of resources and it will have set of databases. Like CPU would be fixed for managed instance. And there can be four databases in it, which will utilize that particular CPU. It, the resources would not be tagged to a single databases, single database. That is the main feature, the main difference between single database and the managed instance. So I'll quickly move on to portal and try, try to create one uh, Azure SQL databases because there are a few important things which we need to cover and that that is our main agenda. We'll, we can go back to this theoretical things. Okay, so I'll quickly explain like how to create a single Azure SQL database. So this is the portal uh where we can create now we can go to services or we can, i can see here the sql database so i'll just on a flag click on sql database yes so creating any new database i'm just clicking on create here it takes me to this window and these are the basic configuration required to create a, any database so subscription as we had in earlier session like what is subscription it's the higher level architecture resource group i have like in in our team we have created our individual resource group so i have my own resource group uh, database name we need to give if we are creating any database so right now i'm creating uh, also guys we need to be ma make sure we follow a standard naming convention when we are working in the organization so i'll just put like we are creating a database so database we are creating for data bag so data bag and i am creating it so my name so there is already one database with the same so i have changed it name and right now i am not uh, showing you elastic pool so i'm telling like elastic elastic pool is no elastic pool is the same thing where we can have multiple databases in one pool so i'll quickly go to compute and storage and i'll explain what it is so for configuring the database we have these options in azure <coughs> so we had uh, gone like what is uh, service tier and compute tier yesterday so we have two options provision and serverless so serverless is generally auto scaled uh, like we really not no we really don't need to see the course and everything it will as per the workload it will automatically increase the core but generally organizations go for provision rather than serverless because they want to see bit of the usage and everything so i'll quickly go to provision so yeah so serverless uh, the service tier we have general purpose uh, hyperscale business critical and we have basically two models in sql server it's v core based model and dtu purchase model v core is like number of cores of the cpu which we want to give to our uh, sql server and sql database and dtu is like uh, data transaction unit it's combination it's it, it's kind of a matrix which is developed by azure it's combination of cpu memory and io Combining three, Azure has created one purchasing model named as DTU, Data Transaction Unit. So DTU also has three features. vCore also has three, three, three types to select. And generally Microsoft recommends to go for vCore based model uh, instead of DTU. But for small application, which are uh, less, workload, less workload, DTU would be more advantageous and uh, of less cost compared to vCore. So I just, want to speed up the thing so i am going for v core i am putting two virtual cores but generally we can go for more than two so data size it's like a storage thing how much storage we want so since it's a demo i am reducing it to 14 gb it is asking me would you like to make the database zone redundant i am putting as no uh, it's zone redundant is a different concept like if one zone if in one zone database gets deleted or something happens to the database we will have the other zone where database backup is there so right now i'm putting putting as no 
and I'm applying these settings. Geo redundant backup storage, this options if you can see. So what does this mean is like our backup would be there at different location. So if something goes wrong at my current location, we have a safe copy of backup in the other location and we can restore that. Uh, next thing is networking. This is very important guys. So we need to make sure whatever we can connect to the SQL server, whatever connections uh, are allowed to our database. So right now I am adding this uh, my systems IP here. So it's like I'll add my current client IP so that I can connect to the system. And we can we can like this is option allow Azure services and resource to access this server. So we can we can have Azure services to access to this uh, particular server which we are creating right now. It's kind of that thing. Right now, uh, I will create a sample database. It will have some data for demo purpose. And this is collation. Collation is nothing but set of rules which SQL Server has. So like suppose a case sensitive is one rule. So that kind of rules are set for um, this uh, SQL database. I am choosing it a default. There will be some mechanism to change it. Tag is something like a property. Like suppose I am the owner, I'll put owner and I'll put my name here. So it's kind of a property and based on that tagging, we can do some coding through Terraform and few other things. I'll, I'm not putting anything right now. I'll just review and create. Okay. So by the time it's creating, I have already one database which is already created. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly go that go to that and I'll try to show you that. Meanwhile, this will create and we can add both of them to the elastic pool and see the elastic pool thing. So this is the database which I already have created in the same way which I created now. So this is the server name. If you can see, I will copy the server name through this icon and I have installed SSMS in my system. Uh, so when you Google uh, SSMS download, uh, it will show you the link to download the SSMS and uh, you can quickly download and install. It's very easy guys. Once you install, you will get this window and once you get this window, uh, it's just that connection you need to click and here you need to provide the server name right now I have copied so this is the server name and while creating we need to put the username and password to the server so what I shown you now was creation of the database uh, I picked the existing server but if we don't have existing server it will ask us to create a new server so let me show that part. So here it is asking me server. So if I put click on create new, it will ask me to put server name, server login, server password, confirming the password and the location. So if I put this, my server would be created. So right now I have already put all these things in a, before showing the demo. So I'll try to connect with those credentials. So this is the server name. This is the login which I had put trying to put the password which I already put. Hopefully it allows me to connect. I'm not sure. If at all there are some issues. Okay. It will currently not allow me because I have we connected. I am disconnecting that part. So yeah, so I have disconnected VPN and it, it allows me to connect. So this is the server which we created and the database I cl clicked on sample. So there is a sample database which is created and I can see the another database which I created in front of you guys. So I had choose the existing server. So there are two databases which we can see both this databases will have the same data since I checked on sample thing on both. So these are the tables and we can query them out. OK. 
Okay, so basically, yeah, this is the sample database which we created. So right now, what I want to show you is the Elastic Pool. So we have two databases right now with us. Now, if we want to put a set of resources in these two databases and manage the work, like we can rely on Azure to manage the workload, how we can add them into Elastic Pool. I'll try to show you that. Um, before that, I can quickly show you like any database we create, we have a uh, option called query editor. So we can query here only. Once we click to database, we can query here only to the database. So these are the tables which I see in my SSMS. I can see here as well in portal. I can query here as well. it tells me it's running the query there is basically no data okay yeah, data is there so this is the this is the data which i can see in the table in my ssms i can see in azure as well okay now we'll quickly uh, we saw the sql database sql service how to create a sql database we'll quickly jump to elastic pool sql elastic pools so I am clicking on create, create a SQL Elastic Pool. So this is the subscription. This is my resource group, the name, I'm creating Elastic Pool. So I'm putting it as Elastic Pool, creating for data bag. So data bag, it's my Elastic Pool. So I'm creating as such. So this is the same uh, like storage part for the Elastic tool. So based on the uh, configuration, we this is same in SQL Server as well and Elastic Pool as well. So based on our selection, we we will get cost here like estimated cost per month. So we can estimate like how much cost we want. Uh, uh, the my, my slide section which was telling predictive performance and money analysis so this is the way if i select this much cpu this is the cost if i select this much cpu this is the cost if i select this much storage this is the cost if i select this much storage this is the cost guys trust me this is really cool feature like in physical servers we need to contact storage team networking team multiple teams multiple costs here we can do all these things on a fly so right now v core model is available for elastic pool so we can select for demo as six cores and database uh, storage size as around be it 102 GB. And this is the section where we can add the databases. So right now we have two databases. So I can add this two databases. So what I have done here is now these databases will no longer have the individual resources. They will take resources from this pool. And whenever one database needs more resources, the pool will allocate that resource to one database. And whenever other needs more, it will allocate to other. So Azure will internally take care of all those things. So these are the number of cores we have allocated to this pool. If I apply, I'll create a new server for this. Guys, if you feel that it's, it's faster, you can just tell us. So we'll try to be slow. So this is the maintenance window default that if at all any updates, patching or anything comes up, Azure will take care of it. We, have, we are creating it. 
so we have created an elastic pool right now we'll see how it is okay meanwhile it's getting created you we'll quickly move to the next slide yeah so as i was seeing whenever we create any azure sql there are two purchasing model azure offers one is dtu that is data transaction unit one is v core number of cores of cpu which we want dtu comes with three three purchasing types basic standard and premium v core comes with the three purchasing types general purpose business critical and hyperscale basic generally no one goes for like it it is kind of a demo thing very small configuration very small cost is involved standard is something which organization with low small applications go for premium is mainly for higher banking sectors or where we need a premium quality as the name suggest general purpose is like a basic thing where small application can go for business critical is application which need like high amount of resources and where are critical we can go hyperscale is more advanced so basically as i shown you drag and dropping that core and storage part you can drag drop in any of the flavors which you want and you can see the cost based on that you based on that you can take a call which is suited for my application but if you are working in enterprise things uh, you will not take basic any time you will just go with the standard and premium you may go with the general purpose if it is a small application consider a small medical store which has fixed set of data coming in coming out for the products you can go for general purpose and basically we can go for general purpose and business critical and v core based model so i'll quickly go through the differences between both these models so basically v core base is for single database elastic pool and manage instance and dtu dtu microsoft doesn't recommend but still people go when they are like kind of a small application and they don't want to both see like cpu memory and all so this is a clubbed version of everything like in v core based model people may see the storage and io things here they only need to see only dtu so people who have very small application less knowledge and they don't want much botherance in their life they will go for D dtu thing and it is only available for uh, single database and elastic tool it's not available for managed instance uh, managed instance i didn't show you how to create it will take around 45 minutes to deploy a managed instance so we don't have that much time but it works in the sim similar way like similar configurations if we click on service called azure managed instance we can see the same things which we configured for single databases or elastic pools so yeah moving on to the second difference like uh, this is best for customer customers who need flexible control and transparency um, best for the customer who want single pre configured resource option yeah so this is a single resource thing only dtu here we have to check for io memory and other resources so if it if like it, it depends as i said on case to case basis people do choose dtu based model people do go for v core based model but if we are new and if we really don't know, if we are going with a standard application we should go for v, v core based that too we can go for like gen, any any in v core we can again see if application is small we can go for general purpose or standard or premium okay so this was like how to create and query the sql server database in azure right now i'll show you how to back up the database and restore it if you want to and also guys right now it's trending like from physical server we are moving to cloud so there are multiple ways to move from physical server to cloud if you, physical server or a virtual machine which we have on remote locations not on cloud so there is something called azure data migration migration service that azure provides this service will take a lot of deployments a lot lot of deployments and we really don't have that much time to go for so i'll i'll quickly share a youtube link for this service uh, if you want to see how it works and how it's not how it not i'll quickly put in the chat once you go to that video you can uh, just let us know uh, if you have any doubt i'm pretty sure you won't have any doubt in this i'll quickly show how backup and restore works so this is my physical local uh, database server and backup uh, databases are attached to it and suppose i need to move, move move this physical server over the cloud server so how to do is just click on the database right click tasks export data tier application basically there are two files deckpack and backpack 
it will create a backpack on cloud it will create a backpack so this will save to my local disk i need to browse and select the disk oh i am selecting see we can see the extension dot backpack cloud backpack file Okay. I'll take this location. So I'm exporting this database backpack file in a normal location and I'll try to put this database in the cloud. So meanwhile, I believe that Elastic Pool second database would have been created. I am querying this Elastic Pool. I it's not yet completed. It's completed now. I believe now I should see here the second database. Okay, it's still not coming. I'll go back again to the elastic pool. Okay, I by mistakenly created a elastic pool, not a database. Okay, so this is my existing elastic pool. Create database I'm clicking on. Second DP. Elastic pool. And create I'm doing create I'm doing so meanwhile this is done I am uh, I just shown you how to take a backpack backpack file in one location I'll see that in that location that backpack file is generated or not Okay, so I have opened that location in my other screen. So this was the location which I gave and I can see the backpack, backpack file generated here. Now this was my physical server, kind of a physical server which is there in my machine right now. I'll try to restore it over a cloud server. So this is one of my cloud server. I'll try to restore that database here. So I'm moving a database from a physical server to a cloud. Yeah, so there is an option called import data tire application. There was an option in physical, it was export data tire application. Similarly, we can do import export from cloud to physical server. So it is telling me to give the location of the backpack file. The location is, this is the location. This is, my backpack file I'm giving here doing next next finish so it it is importing a database from a physical server to a cloud guys we'll see the deployment status meanwhile it says it is completed go to the resource it says it is there go to the elastic pools It saves me two databases. Now, hopefully I should see now two databases in the SSMS. This was my elastic pool.
yeah there are two databases so we can consider this way like first creating a elastic pool first and then adding the databases into it whatever databases we want we can add also we can first create the databases and tag uh, a elastic pool to the existing databases but right now just figuring out how it works so we, we just created one elastic pool and added two databases now these two databases will share the resources and all the things will work and this is a elastic pool server it's not a server related to one fixed database and we can add multiple databases like this so we had done the restore on a cloud so the database name was adventure works 2019 i believe it should come here yeah so uh, the i had renamed the file to new cloud backpack file so it has came with that name but data should be same in both we'll quickly check so there is one table called error log i'll try to query that table there is no data but similar table should be there in this database i'll quickly query <laughs> okay it's not there did i choose any other database Okay, we'll quickly run a few steps. Task. okay so meanwhile this happens uh, will will i'll quickly show you two or three good features which we have uh, let me see how much it has progressed so uh, there is something called high availability and disaster recovery so that means whatever data i have in one database similar kind of database should data set should be there in the other database or um, same kind of data should be moving like if i insert one record in one table that same replication should happen in the second server which is at the remote location so that if at all primary server goes down we have the data in the secondary server and application get connected to secondary server without a downtime and we have no data loss so azure offers sql based sql based on sql database two features named as failover groups and geo replication which maintains high availability and disaster recovery so geo replication mainly maintains a uh, replication thing uh, like whatever i will have on my primary server it will try to have same data in the secondary server and secondary server would be read only we will just be running select queries on the secondary server and we can have our select workload on the secondary server configured so i have this server i'll try to create one replica for this so create replica i am clicking on create replica now it asks me server i can put a database name with the same database with the same name already exist on the server okay i can create 
data since i'm creating its replica the name should be same so i'm creating a new server for this so for geo replication Okay, so I have created a new server in location. I have choose US East. We can have a uh, different different location. Networking. So I'm just creating it out and we'll see if we are able to query and we will see putting the data that automatically data is coming to the other server or not. Okay, before that we will see here. Uh, okay, so maybe we just close the operation before uh, this operation was completed in the backpack file. We'll try to see again that restore part. So this was my physical server where I generated the backpack file. I'm going to cloud server, import data tire explain next browsing new migration backpack. Next. Database name. Is equal. So till this deployment runs, we'll quickly move to that our replica thing. It is also deploying. Yeah, so basically what it offers is geo replication and uh, uh, Azure failover groups is like if at all, or any insert update delete operation is coming on primary server. Uh, it, there are two types of synchronization, a synchronous commit or synchronous commit. In synchronous commit, our transaction will get first committed to primary and it will wait till it gets committed to secondary and then it will move to the next record. Like first my insert will come to one server. It will come, it will not commit until and unless it is also inserted in the secondary server. In a synchronous commit, it will the transaction will come to primary server it will commit and then send the data to secondary server like if at all something goes wrong with the second server it is not bothered like it will move to the next transaction in the primary server and it will put the secondary transaction in a queue to get committed later on So it tells it is in progress. We'll quickly discuss about security things also. Uh, guys, we may extend a bit, like maybe 15 more minutes if you are comfortable. Uh, so we'll try to cover the security aspects on Azure SQL, which are very important. Uh, that's the only thing which I wanted to cover security, high availability, disaster recovery, migration options. Uh, DMS is really cool service, which I would have shown you if time permits and I have provided a YouTube link to everyone. You can go through it. Okay, so our deployment for a secondary replica is com completed. I'm going to that resource. Okay. So this is the server name. Uh, I had created a new server. Now.
I'll try to query this. If I'll see, I'm able to query. So right now I'm disconnecting this elastic pool server concept. Again, I had not whitelisted the IP, so it will prompt me to do that. Okay, so we have the replication thing available for this night now. We'll quickly see in replicas if we can see something currently for this server. This so right now we see like this is my primary server. If I go to replica, this is my secondary server. So we need to have same data in both and we need to see if we can see that part practically and as you can see this is online status replica state and this will be readable we can't do any write operation on this so right now i'll try to connect on both so this is my geo replica i was able to connect uh, on the replication server so this is my primary server and this is my replication replication server. Now what I will do is I'll insert something in this. Automatically the data should come in this. We'll try to see that practically it's working or not. Or I'll create something in this and it should automatically get created in this. So I'll quickly write a create table query. Create table test for replication we need to provide column names i am putting id as integer i am taking one column only right now so the table is created now i have not i have not created the same table in this server but i am expecting it to come today my day is bad i am not sure it will come or not but it should come So guys, these both are there on different locations and like totally different servers. Okay, so I created in uh, the primary server and we'll see if we can uh, get the same value or not. So I will first run a select query fast in this table. So right now it's totally empty. Now I am inserting it. Insert into table name values. Insert into. Okay, maybe I need to provide the column. Okay, I have not written T here. So one row affected, I am seeing data getting inserted in the primary side. So now I'm querying, we can see at the top right corner, uh, I'm querying this server and the database is database hyphen data bag dot lux this server. Now I have not queried anything or any, uh, not written anything here in this server, but the data should have already come in here. So I will query now the secondary server. This is my second summer and data is pop coming up here also. So replication is working. So guys, you can see this is a real time replication. Whatever data comes in primary automatically, it would be there in secondary. Now in secondary, it's a read only. So we will not be able to run any insert or anything in the secondary. Like it would be read only and we can de like divert a read only workload there. 
so right now this is an insert i am trying to query in secondary it will it should throw me an error so it throw, throws me an error because the database is read only so this was one cool feature provided by azure a geo replication thing and i think uh, the backpack backpack thing which we were trying to do should have completed by now so hopefully that issue also resolves okay yeah so this this was the uh, which i taken from physical server this was my data backpack file now priorly i was seeing no data in it maybe i cancelled in middle or what i did i'm not sure but right now again i took a backpack file and i restored i am expecting some data to come yes so data is coming so it's we are good so it, it should be the same data in the physical server uh, so this is the data in physical um, and we have the same build version error log build version error log and same tables so i shown you how to move a physical server database to a cloud and we can similarly move from cloud to physical server by export and import tire thing uh, amazon uh, azure D, dms service is really cool feature it 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 does behind the scene log shipping like it's will be a real time replication and a cutoff but if our can bear a small downtime we can go with this methodology as well so we are good with that part so right now i covered how to move a database from physical server to cloud cloud to physical server and also storage account which we know that explained yesterday we can put our database and database backups to that storage account and uh, we can take from that storage account download any time like a storage account is nothing but it can hold any type of files in it okay so i can show you the failover groups as well but since we are running out of time i'll quickly explain how it is so the main difference between zero replication and failover group is like in failover group we can have a set uh, the zero replication thing we can suppose something happens uh, to my primary server and i need to bring this replication as the secondary server so i need to do a failover which will allow my secondary to become primary and primary to become secondary so that operations can be done in geo replication and in failover group we can configure two to two to three databases in one group and we can do a failover for all two to three databases together like all three databases will be in primary and three databases in this will be there in the secondary and data primary to secondary and we can do the failover but here we are just tagging one database per, per each group so this is the main key difference and there will be few other differences which uh, as well for that but i am not recalling right now and both like fail that uh, failover group is mainly for a disaster recovery thing and uh, this replication is for high availability thing geo replication i'm trying to see my notes if i have taken uh, the main difference points which i can give you yeah so failover group will have automatic failover like for geo replication we need to do uh, like forceful failover uh, if needed like we can do a faceful, forceful failover but if the application goes down in failover group it will do automatic failover and uh, we can have multiple databases in failover groups in geo replication we can't have multiple we will have single databases and sql managed instance does not support geo replication but it does support the failover groups and fail geo replication can be there in the same region as well primary and secondary can be there in the same region but failover group must have a different region now they, these are the main 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 differences which we have over so whenever we will have geo replication we will have replica type is geo
okay so i'll quickly move to security i'll quickly show failover how it looks like it is available for sql server so i'll quickly go to the sql server yeah so this is failover groups so it is similar to what i created right now but we just need to add a group here we need to select the server from which we want to add and failover policy we need to select automatic or manual there will be when we google out there will be some option to failover if we click on that automatically primary will become secondary and secondary will become primary right now i am not navigating much so we can uh, in this way we can create a failover group as well so this is the service of failover group now i'll quickly jump into security things so basically there are four types of securities which azure sql offers first one is network security and that is like our we are whitelisting the ips like who can connect to the database that is covered in the network security mainly like we'll put ips and traffic which we want to connect second thing is access management it's like who can access our sql database and uh, like access management segregates in two parts that is authorization access and authentication access authentication means like when i am saying i am this user am i really that user like i will have a user and password for that and authorization means the ability to like what kind of access i have like a read write permissions which we have so i am i am authorized to do that only threat protection is something like azure it has inbuilt capabilities to find the like threatful attempts which we try to uh, which 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 database tries to get from other sources if we see the repetitive such information it will put an alarm to us last thing is information protection information protection is something like the data should be available for like what kind of data should be visible to which kind of people it is kind of that way like we can have a row level security like if if there is a data table which stores social security number a credit card number or if anything is such such th such kind or if email address also suppose if i am querying that table i should be able to see my email and my contact information i shouldn't be able to see x y z person's contact information so we can create a function in in sql server and like in build function will be there which will provide row level security we will be able to see the rows whichever we are trying which which are needful for us we won't be able to see the extra rows and also we can azure has feature to mask the sensitive information through a uh, feature called data masking and also there are few features like auditing and various other sec uh, security feature basically they all come come under Uh, they all come under this uh, data security thing uh, like not network or anything like how to secure the data so if i quickly see the security thing these are the main security things which are available transparent data encryption what this means is data at the rest would be encrypted like when till i query the data table or in my backup file automatically azure will have it enabled transparent data capture is enabled dynamic data masking like this is uh, this is these are like this will come like table and column which i need to mask so in this server i can suppose i want to mask email address i can add a mask here and after that i'll just save it so it is saving the settings so when i query them that i would see email email address in a mask format i am getting some error okay because i have created multiple databases i am not sure which is read only or which is what so i'll try to add in different server okay here i am able to have that field successfully mask sales to customer i'll quickly try to go to this database
database database okay. customer Okay, right now it's not masking uh, some access or some permissions we need to add over it. Uh, we'll try to mask phone number. Okay, there is something called masking rule which we need to provide. So if I provide credit card rule, it should mask in this format. Okay, we'll try to see if at all anything has changed. Refresh. No luck. Okay, so mainly these are the things I'm like juggling here and there. So some something I'm missing, I'll see that thing or maybe some server name or database name. rule and it has inbuilt mask rule available in it and we need to follow that rule like a credit card rule uh, it has a default value uh, it will like there is two types of encryption mainly deterministic and randomized so these are kind of determin deterministic thing like this will have this kind of set uh, like xyz will have abc or some kind of masking which is determinist deterministic so these are the features mainly available uh, for security part. And we have something called always encryption, uh, always encryption available in Azure SQL database. And that is also a good feature in that like TD is encrypting database only at rest. But if a database is not at rest, even while querying, we'll see the database masking is available. So, that feature is also available but since i'm running out of time i'm not uh, practically showing you all those things but it can be configured through ssms uh, we in database in security there is something called always encryption and we can turn it on in security always encrypted keys so there is something called key vault in Azure. So that will hold this master key and that key will generate some password for any column which we try to put here. So if I go this option, say I go next, 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 master key will get generated. I will also be able to log into Azure key vault and create my own one master key. And it will try to create a encrypted key for any kind of column which I am trying to do. So yeah, that's all I wanted to present. 